Okay, we're at Eastman School of Music with Clay Jenkins. Clay, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Derek. Glad to be here. Clay, let's go back a few weeks to the Gil Evans project you did, and people are still talking about it. What was it like for you to play the music that Miles and Gil Evans did 50 years ago? Well, I've done um, Porgy and Bess quite a few times, and I've also done Miles Ahead, so to do Quiet Nights and Sketches of Spain was a real honor and pleasure and blessing. It was just fantastic. And, and they're sort of, especially Sketches is one of the more uh, romantic ones and more dramatic ones, so it's impossible to fill Miles' shoes on that because he was the, the greatest at that kind of music, but uh, it was really an honor to play the music. Their music's so well written and Ryan Trustel did a great job with it, so I, I, I really enjoyed doing it. Speaking with Clay Jenkins here in Jazz 90.1. That said, now you've been doing this for so long. Talk about the teaching side. You teach jazz to a bunch of kids who really love this, they want to make it their passion and vocation. How do you kind of direct them and point them to the right way? Or can you? Well, it's my, my teaching, I think, has evolved some since I've been here. I've been here 12 years, and my colleagues are such high-esteemed high colleagues like Harold Danko and Bill Dobbins and Jeff Campbell and and Darius Terafinko, they're such great teachers and players and musicians and composers that, and they're also really good teachers, so I came here thinking I was a pretty good teacher, but I have a lot to learn, and I, I've learned, uh, I've learned that it's okay to be different, we're, we're all very different. My approach is um, that we, my students, we strive for depth of, of musicality, and, and, and that covers, and that's in everything, in terms of vocabulary, technique, knowledge of the history, knowledge of the legacy, knowledge of theory. So the more depth we have, I've learned that with myself as a player, it gives me more choices and then I can have more options. Whereas if I'm not quite, if I don't have the, the depth of groove or the depth of knowledge, then I don't have as many choices. And I want the guys to have as many choices as they can because it's, it's not an easy way to make a living. So they, they need lots of options. Speaking with Clay Jenkins, Clay, let's go back to the very beginning. Where are you from and who were your influences growing up and playing? What got you to play? Well, I, I grew up in Lubbock, Texas. And not exactly a jazz mecca, but uh, my dad was a Dixieland trumpet player. So I grew up uh, in a pretty strict uh, home and he insisted if, if I was going to play and, and take lessons that I practiced every day. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had some really good teachers, and then I went to uh, North Texas State University, when, uh, which is also in, in Texas, out near Dallas, and uh, which was a great experience. And then I went on the road with uh, Stan Kenton in 1977, and uh, stayed with Stan a few years. And from those bands, I, went, I ended up playing with other big bands, as was the case back then, uh, Buddy Rich and Cal Basie and Harry James. and. So, and then I moved to Los Angeles and I lived there for 22 years. And then uh, I got a, a call to audition here 12 years ago and I've been here for 12 years now. Wow. Let's talk about those little stops along the way. What was it like with Stan Kenny? Because you were the, that last edition of his group and uh, the whole Street of Dreams album that came out with that, that crew. And what was that like? Because I just can't imagine Stan being with that and just seeing that day in, day out, but we're working with a master like him. We all really loved Stan. Stan had his idiosyncrasies. Yeah, put it mildly. <laughs> he did, as all leaders do. But, but he, he definitely did. But he was a really nice guy most of the time. I, we all loved Stan, and we were real close. I'm still real close with some of the guys I was on the Stan's band with. Um, so that was a lot of fun. And, and then when he got hurt, uh, the band kind of folded up. And then with Buddy Rich's band, he, he kind of had a reputation of being sort of, yeah. sort of. Uh, having a bad temper, but I, I got along with him really well. And, and, and the level of musicality on that, on that band was really high. And then I, when I did Basie, those guys were so, so respectful of everyone in the band. I mean, you just, that was just a, a thing. You, you dress nicely when you, when you flew on planes, and it was, a, it was really a very good lesson in respectfulness. Yeah. They treated me with the utmost respect. And, and, I learned that that's really important. You know, I even learned it m more so on that band. So, 
and the level of musicianship on that band was great, night after night. They've been playing that stuff a long time, and every night was swinging and killing. You know, what was it like for you in a basic band? Because this is a, the book that had been there pretty much locked in for at least at that time, probably twenty years. Yes. And some of the pieces are 40 or 50 years old, but yet they brought passion every single performance where they could have just punched it in. What did that teach you in terms of being a performer, being in that, that organization? It told me, that's why I first kind of learned about the, the depth, especially on that band, the depth of swing. And then my hero, besides Miles Davis, and my hero on the trumpet is uh, uh, Thad Jones. And he came out to lead the band as I was leaving, so I got to be with him a little bit, and then I went back to seven. And his concept, and I mean, he would rehearse the band. He'd rehearse the band on April in Paris. Really? Yeah, it was amazing. They April in like, Paris. They didn't like it either. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't like rehearsing yeah. that. But he said, "Well, the band's not swing is, and, and I, as hard as it could." And I, I learned a lot from that. I learned a lot from from just being around Thad. That that little bit I was with him, you know. So, yeah, I mean, every night the band played to its fullest, to its very fullest. They never, ever. Uh, eased up. Never. Mm. It's funny you mentioned Thad Jones. In the last 20 years or so, there's been a real push, I've noticed, I've noticed in conservatories, Eastman, Berkeley, Juilliard, to really investigate the work of Thad Jones in terms of as an arranger, as a performer. What is so special about Thad Jones, about his work that people should study and really pass on to the next generation? I, it's interesting, because I, I was real close with Snooky Young. I, I oh, probably knew that. And, uh, but I've been. I was on the Clayton band with Snooky for 26 years. Wow. He just passed away last year. Yeah, you know? yeah. So that was a real education. And he and Thad were on Basie's band together. They were roommates, and so I got, I, I got a really nice uh, inside look at Thad through Snooky because Snooky had been around Thad a long time. And and Snooky told me that Thad would write charts on the bus, and and uh, he was pretty self-taught. And he was a, he was kind of a self-taught trumpet player as well. Mm. So he was he was a really amazing guy. And he he broke a lot of rules in terms of arranging. And and myself, I think he played and wrote in a similar fashion. I, in fact, when I was in college, I wrote a paper on co comparing Thad's writing and his playing. And there's a lot of parallels. So to me, I, he was a visionary, and he was ahead of his time. He was playing things in the '40s in solos that. We, we look at now and say, wow, that was, that was way ahead of his time. And so his writing was that way too. And uh, his, some of his charts are now 40 and 50 years old and they're still, they could have been written yesterday, they're so fresh. So it is a, a, a real important study of Thad Jones. And he was a tunesmith as well. I've, I've become uh, familiar with a lot of his original just tunes, sure. you know. And, and man, he, he wrote some great tunes, which is not always the case with arrangers, you know. So he was, a, he was quite, a, quite an amazing artist. Speaking with Clay Jenkins here on Jazz 90.1, that said, Clay, for students who are coming to Eastman, and they, I mean, they have, obviously have a lot of talent, what do you try to tell them in terms of honing the talent? Do you ask them about their influences, who influenced you in playing, or do you tell them, or show them, here are some of the folks that you need to look at and listen to to really get your chops together? Well, as a teacher, um, I'm always looking for things they may have missed along the way, and all of us have those things. I, I certainly do still, and I certainly did when I was their age. Mm -hmm. So we look for for ways we can kind of fill in some gaps, or if they're if they're one of those people that that are very um, enamored with with looking at um, things so so thoroughly that they they don't want to push ahead at all. That's kind of my job too, I think. Sometimes that can be the case. How do you do that? I just try to be uh, as loving as I can, because I, that can be frustrating. But I, I know they get frustrated too. We, I love, I love our school here, and I love, I love the the scene, the way we we work with people. Like I said, our, my colleagues, we're not all the same. We're very different. Oh yeah. And that's healthy, I think. So I, I, I tend to. I think we need to check out newer music, and uh, that's one of the things that we have kind of a pull and tug with sometimes in the department is checking out newer music. But that's good because there's a real, there's a real honesty and an honor to the legacy of the music. So I think it's a good balance. But I feel like 
to be artists in the future, we, we need to be able to play newer music with, with uh, an honest um, tip of the hat to the legacy. Mm. So like the flag says, take jazz further, that's how you do it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> it's I mean, I don't want to play older style now. I want, I, I want to keep moving ahead, but I, I love playing standards and things like that. So I think it's just, uh, it's that thing of, of depth. You're not going to have as much depth if you don't study the music that's happened before you. And currently. Right? That says, so who are the players today that really are turning your ear thinking this person's taking it, for, taking it further and farther? You mean trumpet players? Yeah, trumpet players. Yeah. Well, trumpet players, I mean, a lot of them are here this week. There's Nicholas Payton, and there's uh, Terrence Blanchard, and there's Terrell Stafford, and there's Winton, of course, and, uh, and uh, there's, there's, there's a guy that used to teach here, Ralph Alessi. And, That's right. And, uh, boy, there's, there's so many great trumpet players. There's a friend of mine in, in New York, a very unknown guy who's been a, a big influence to me. His name's Davey Scott. Hmm. And uh, so I... I know a lot of guys that really are taking it to and to the next level, and the level of trumpet playing is is just amazing to me. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of young guys coming up. So it's a it's an ever evolving scene, uh, the the jazz scene. It's really it keeps you young. Yeah. Speaking of Clay Jenkins, Clay, another question for you. I've noticed that some conservatories have a I don't say a struggle, but just a conflict of do they promote their kids to write more and compose more on their own? Or do they try to get them to know the repertoire, know the standards, and then eventually get along with writing? What's your take on that? I think it's got to be a balance. Um, we, I think our balance is pretty good here because I, I really insist that my guys write. I think it's good for their playing, and I think it's good for their, for their skill as a compositional improviser to be a writer. Not that writing and playing are the same, but a lot of the skills can be related. So I find it really important to, that all my guys write. And, uh, and then Bill Dobbs is so amazingly skilled at, at just uh, and really uh, mining the fundamentals of, of the skills of arranging that, that our guys come out such good writers. So many of the guys are really good writers. Be it, no, like myself, I'm not a great arranger. I'm more of a tune writer, but uh, we have some guys that are really writing up a storm in terms of tunes and arranging. So I think it's a healthy situation here at Eastman. So, Clay, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for, for having me.